I just wanted to uh, make mention of something that is in your bulletin, uh, but just wanted to highlight. Um, CLOW has been uh, organizing for us a really neat project where we're able to give uh, Bibles or Christian books, resources, even homeschool material that's just kind of in the way at home, something we're not using at all. Um, we're able to um, gather all that together and get it to a, a Michigan uh, resource and they organize everything, and then missionaries come in and get what they need, and then these books, homeschool, Christian books, Bibles, are, are taken literally around the world. Um, I, I know if you're anything at all like me, and I know you hope you're not, but if you're anything like me, um, it's easy to accumulate lots of things, and I was amazed at how many Bibles I had stacked up. Um, and so it, on Wednesday is our final day. We're going to be uh, transporting that to the Resource Center. Um, but if you think of it, if the Lord lays that on your heart, um, either tonight at church or on Wednesday, if you have any extra Bibles uh, that you would like to see go to a good home, we've got a, a place we can connect you to. So the books go in the back in the narthex there. You'll see the boxes uh, marked well. Thank you, Pastor Land, and Good morning. Take your Bibles, please. We're turning to Genesis chapter 6. We're going to be reading the first four verses. So here we go, Genesis chapter 6 beginning with verse 1 and reading through the fourth verse, I'll invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's holy and precious word. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his day shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, the same became mighty men who were of old men of renown. Thank you. you may be seated for our time of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so privileged to be in this place, and we've come again with a singular purpose, a single purpose, and that is to worship our great God and our Savior. We're off to a good start, but Lord, I pray that you'll re-impress upon our hearts that one of the very clear and concrete and significant ways in which we can worship you pertains to the way in which we respond to your word. Our heart cry is that the Holy Spirit of God would continue to turn the light on for us. I pray that we would indeed see your truth, but not that alone. That we would desire with passion to implement such truth into our lives. And uh, as we do that, people will be saved, and we certainly pray towards that end. And for those who already know you, uh, we certainly will be stirred in our faith, and for that we are glad. God, we are a needy people, and we are glad to be able to recognize that before you. And so many of our people are hurting, and you know our hearts in regard to each one and our persistent and passionate prayers. 
but we are praying again and especially for Brother Jerry Melvin this morning as he continues to be in a critical state. Pray, Lord, that you would have in your grace and mercy your healing hand upon him, that uh, you would uh, recoup and rehabilitate him, Lord. Thank you that you are our great high priest who is touched by the feelings of our infirmities. Thank you that you're always with us. Thank you that you perfectly surround us with your protection and your provision. We revel in these things. Lord, we're careful to pray for those who may be here or within the sound of this voice who have not yet put personal faith and trust in the one and only Savior. I pray that today, this hour, would be the hour, the day of their salvation. Thank you for the opportunity we have to give back to you a portion of all that you've entrusted to our care. May this, too, be a part of our worship of our great God today. We pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, ladies, for that beautiful music, culminating with, without him, life would be nothing. Praise God for his son, Jesus Christ, and we, life we have through him. Let's stand once more together, singing 319. We're going to do verse 1, 2, and verse 4, omitting the third verse. Children, uh, those who are here, um, you're dismissed on that second verse. So standing 319. Immortal, invisible, God only wise. One, two, and four. Mm -hmm. Immortal, invisible, God only wise. Enlightened, accessible, hid from our eyes. Most blessed, most glorious, the ancient heart. Unhasting and silent as life, or wanting or wasting, thou rulest in life. Be the mountain, thy soaring above, my clouds with our fountains of goodness and love. Great Father of glory. 
Thank you, ladies. It's always a treat for us when you pray, uh, play your instruments for the Lord. We appreciate that very much, and, and uh, we, we also appreciate uh, the quick trip to Calvary and uh, the reminder of the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ loved us so much that he was willing to take our place on Calvary's cross, and also such a song spurs us on to worship our great creating seeking and saving God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love uh, the way in which all these different instruments resound to your honor and glory. 
exalting you and you alone, and that's the way that it ought to be. We love uh, the way in which so many of our songs, almost all of them in some way, at least indirectly, remind us of Calvary. Your great love for us, which you displayed there, the love of Christ, so deep and so wide that he was willing to take our place and bear the penalty of our sins so that we wouldn't have to. In fact, that's the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, Christ crucified for us, buried and risen from the grave. And so we would even now and again pray for those who have not yet put personal faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. God, the way that we worship you, again, is multifold, including and especially how we handle your precious word. And as we were reminded uh, earlier, even during our Sunday school hour, we are every time that we open up the pages of your book, certainly standing on holy ground. And we gladly acknowledge well, I would say our desperate dependency upon the great illuminator. So do your work, God. Do all that you desire to do in each heart, starting with mine, I pray. For Jesus' sake, amen. Our study in Genesis continues. We are presently hovering over a most curious text in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. No matter how you look at it, it is a strange and sad Event And as we stated last week, uh, whatever it is that unfolds here, it um, proves to be the proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back. For God, following this event, triggers those events which will ultimately usher in the flood. So the question is, what do we have here in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4? Specifically, what does it mean? that the sons of God took the daughters of men and bore children. I'm rehearsing very quickly with you that there are primarily two views. By the way, the, for the, the more you look into this, the, the, the more views you arrive at, but all of those different kinds of views basically fall under two uh, major headings. There are primarily two views. I acknowledge that they're held, each one held by very, very good men, I mean, not just good men from my perspective, but but certainly that. The first view is that the sons of God here represent the godly line of Seth, and so the daughters of men here in turn would represent the ungodly line of Cain, and so it's an issue between the Sethites and the Cainites. The point, if that's the proper view here, is that we have an intermarriage between the godly and the ungodly, between the saved and the unsaved, between the righteous and the unrighteous. Now, I don't want to miss an opportunity to stress again how sinful that is. We have clear biblical dictate from God, the gracious and merciful God, who wants only your good. 2 Corinthians 6.14, be ye not unequally yoked with unbelievers. And although uh, that um, phrase unequally yoked uh, is broad, it is clearly talking about our intimate relationships. And the most intimate human relationship is the relationship that takes place between a man and his wife, a husband and his wife, and God is on eternal record, and he couldn't be any clearer, don't do that. So we know that that's sinful. That's view one. The second view is that the designation of the sons of God is actually referring to angels. Oh boy. In this particular case, fallen, evil angels that had the capacity, either through possession, some promote the idea that we have like uh, demonic possession going on, either through possession or expression to take on human physical form to cohabitate sexually with human women who in turn were impregnated and subsequently gave birth to a race of beings Well, we really don't know for sure what they were, uh, neither fully human nor fully angelic. I'm noting with you again this morning that 
Although that sounds like science fiction, we have actually begun to, give, uh, to gather biblical warrant for, if not believing that view, at least considering it. And I think all of that is very important for God's people. We have already noted that in the, New, in the Old Testament, I'm restating, we have already noted that in the Old Testament, the designation of sons of God always refers to angels. Job takes that particular phrase, and by the way, you would, and I'm not, um, I'm not a linguist, you would have to be a linguist to appreciate the particular form that we have here in the Hebrew, and you need to use that as your guide, and as you do, you recognize that the only other place that you find this particular designation, this phrase, as it stands in the original language, is used by Job, again, in his ancient book, and he uses it three times. Each time... Again, contextually, it's very clear that Job is referring to angels. So that's a significant consideration for us. But we found further biblical warrant in two other sister texts. And interestingly so, they both come from the New Testament. I'm referring to 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, and Jude, verses 6 and 7. I'd like that this morning, this is a significant enough thing, I'd like to revisit those texts as we didn't have the time last week to fully observe. So take a look with me. Turn, first of all, to 2 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5. Again, this is so very interesting. 2 Peter chapter 2, and verses 4 and 5. Read carefully. Listen carefully. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. As you're looking down, I want you to see again the word sinned at the beginning of verse 4, as in the angels that sinned. I need to tell you that the verb there is in the aorist tense. This is helpful and informative to us. That communicates to us that this particular activity, this particular sin, took place at a particular time and in the past, a particular event that took place in the past at a particular time. Now, if you are like me, when I first put these sister texts together, you may be thinking when you read 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, that Peter here is actually referencing the original fall of Satan, and you know that well, where Satan fell and then subsequently took an, a, a huge angelic horde, not all the angels, but many of them, took a huge angelic horde with him. They chose to follow after Satan. But Peter's next statement negates that. He goes on to qualify that these angels that sinned at a particular time in the past were at that particular time confined. Say, Pastor Tom, you're saying that a little bit dramatically. It's very important. Here's what Peter writes, that God, quote, cast them down to hell. If you weren't with us, I remind you that here we have the Greek word tartaros. It is a special, theologians believe it is a special compartment of Hades or Sheol, which is the place of the dead. Peter writes that God, quote, cast them down to hell and delivered them, again at that particular time, into chains of darkness to be reserved. Now Peter switches. Are you with me so far? Now Peter switches to the present tense to communicate to us that this is the way it has been and this is the way that it continues to be for this particular group of angels. I'm starting again. 
Peter writes that God cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. In other words, and by the way, we don't normally see angels. We know that. One of the characteristics of angels is that they are normally invisible. We also know, and you would know this from your own personal study of the Word of God, that especially in the Old Testament economy, which we are dealing with uh, in regard to the story in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, is that the angels often took on particular appearances and I also remind you that when they did, invariably, when it was a human appearance, they, invariably it was in the form of a male. In fact, further with a view to what, unspire, what, what un, uh, un, unfolded in, in Genesis 18 and 19, we understand that angels, when they took on human form, had human capacity, so much so that the angels actually ate with the great Old Testament patriarch Abraham. You and I don't normally see angels, but I can assure you of this, that even were we to see an angel, I, I can assure you that the angel that we would see, or at least I'll state it like this, the angel that you and I would have any kind of dealings with, and by the way, there are some wonderful dealings in regard to angels and their ministry to us, which uh, we certainly have and will continue to rejoice in. I can assure you that these angels, you've had no dealings with whatsoever. And the reason why I can be dogmatic about that is because of Peter's clear words. These angels sinned in a at a particular time. It was a particular sin that took place at a particular time in the past. And at the time of that particular sin, Peter communicates with clarity, God can find them. The reason why I'm stressing that so dogmatically is because it's the exact opposite with what you know to be true of Satan and the rest of his horde. In fact, I was just rehearsing that again this morning devotionally. We have verses like 1 Peter 5, 8, right? Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil, like a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The fact of the matter is, we, we, and you've heard this often from me, and I'm reflecting on my heart, not yours, we have a natural tendency to let the pendulum swing from one extreme to another. I remember there was a time, and this was, I think, broadly true of Christendom, when when uh, God really burst our bubble when we realized that we weren't going to be able to blame all of our personal sins on Satan. We really bought into the idea Satan made me do it. I remember trying that on my mom and dad, and my mom and dad would have none of that. And they reminded me that God would have none of that either. But th that is one extreme, but what did we do? Then we let the pendulum swing all the way to the other extreme, so that God's people arrived at the place where they figured that uh, Satan was either a myth or if he was real, he had very little influence and, and we would have very little dealings with him and his horde. And here's Peter, again writing in 1 Peter 5, 8, such a familiar verse, and he's telling us, listen, you need to understand this. Satan is right now, this very moment, walking about seeking whom he may devour. If anything is clear in regard to Satan and the bulk of his horde, it is that they are not confined. Satan is, if I may say it this way, alive and well and very active. If it wasn't for the fact that most of God's people, and again, I'm not finger pointing, if it wasn't for the fact that most of God's people have allowed Satan to move them to the place where they are no longer a concern to him, we would be conscious of this spiritual battle daily and even moment by moment being in our face. So much so that when we wake up in the morning and many times throughout the course of the day, we would be re-embracing the command to be strong in the Lord in the power of his might for we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers and against the rulers of the darkness of this world in which we live. But alas, he need not care for most of us because... He's got us right where we want it. He, he wants us. Shame. 
So we go from one extreme to the other. We, we're disappointed that we couldn't say, you know, uh, the devil made me do it, and so we bought into the other extreme. And here's Satan in the middle, very, very active. One thing we know about Satan, without doubt, he is not confined. By the way, and I, I, I can picture uh, Pastor Landon stressing this with the young people. What an interesting word, phrase, walk about the Satan walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You, you would have to envision someone literally making circles around you to appreciate the term. See how much we miss, and yet how very clear God is. So catch this, and forgive me for the Tommy Teal language, but Peter here in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verses 4 and 5 then is talking about a group of angels, a select group of angels that sinned at a particular time in the past. And at that particular time when they sinned, God confined them and they are confined presently and will remain in that state until the end of the millennial reign of Christ. Absolutely amazing. Peter says they're confined and they will be confined ultimately until the great white throne judgment. In contrast to them is Satan and the rest of his horde who will not be confined until the millennial reign of Christ. And then for you guys you, you, you theologians, you know that he will be released one final time at the end of the millennium. Part of the reason why I'm stressing that is because Peter does, and also I need to re try to relate to you something uh, th that was a personal hurdle that I had to get over in regard to this particular view. Because frankly, we're talking about such a grave and sinister scenario that you would naturally have the fear that, man, if something happened like that in the past, then what's preventing it from happening now or perhaps in the future? But Peter answers that. He's saying again, let me restate, this is a select group of, of angels that were um, involved in a particular sin that took place in the past, and God at that particular time confined them and they will be confined right up until the great white throne judgment. You don't have to worry about having contact with these angels. And you and I do not have to worry about an event such as what we may have here in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, of ever happening again. Now, quickly, a second observation before we move to Jude. And Jude is going to really nail this thing for us. Peter, at the beginning of verse 5, gives us a time frame. Peter, at the beginning of verse 5, gives us a time frame as to when the angels sinned. He ties their sin to the old world. In other words, they sinned before the flood and at the time of Noah. It's interesting that Peter actually gives us Noah's name. We know this about the sin. We know that it took place sometime in the past at a particular time. We know that when they sinned, God confined these angels, and they'll be confined right up until the great white throne judgment where they subsequently will be cast into the lake of fire. And we know when they sinned. They sinned in the old world before the flood and at the time of Noah. Now, with all of that information, head over then. You need not turn many pages to Jude just before the revelation. Now we're looking at verses 6 and 7. Jude, verses 6 and 7. And the angels who kept not their first estate but left their own habitation. By the way, again, we read that terminology, and we would be quick, and rightfully so, to figure that we're 
that, that Jude now is talking about uh, Satan's original fall, but you read the very next term or terms and you realize that that can't be the case. I start again. And the angels who kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Now, I wish you could see in the original language from, uh, from Peter's words to Jude, because if you, if, if you and I read Greek, we would be impressed with the fact, and by the way, our English translation does a good job in honoring what I'm saying to you, we'd be impressed with the fact that Jude uses the very same terms that Peter uses. Folks, we have semantical reason for believing that these two texts are absolutely sister texts. Jude, of course, is going to give us added information, and we gladly welcome that as we continue to allow God to answer some of the questions and qualms that we may still have. I'm reading verses 6 and 7 now without interruption. And the angels who kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Jude communicates to us that these angels left their normal sphere of operation, their normal realm of activity, and did something that is almost unspeakable. So grave, I'm restating, so grave and so sinister is their sin that God at that time when they sinned confined this group of angels. But What was their grave and sinister sin? Verse 7. Even as, just like Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them, in like manner. Jude, by the way, and again, it's stronger in the original. I encourage you certainly to do your own study in regard to this, but Jude is, is relating in kind, the sin that would take place later at Sodom and Gomorrah and the sin that took place regarding angels recorded in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, whom Peter has referenced in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner gave themselves, here's the kind, They gave themselves over to fornication and went after strange flesh. Almost unbelievably, the angels' sin that Peter references in 2 Peter 2, 4, and 5, that Jude is referencing here and that we believe are linked then to our text in Genesis 6 and verses 1 through 4, Almost unbelievably, the angel's sin was sexual in nature. Jude pulls out all the stops so that he would clearly and effectually communicate to us that the sin that would take place later at Sodom and Gomorrah would be sexual in nature. You and I know that very well. And that the sin that took place that Peter references in regard to this select group of angels was again sexual in nature. Jude calls it a fornication. Two groups committing fornication. The angels that sinned in the past at a particular time and the sin that unfolded in Sodom and Gomorrah. Interesting word, fornication get ready to get a little bit uncomfortable in your seat. It's the Greek word pornuo. We get our English word pornography. 
by the way, if you need motivation for not engaging in the grave sin of pornography, or if you need motivation to um, rid yourself of pornography, know this, that God views it as a gross immorality, just so that you know. But Jude does something else, and again, you'd have to see the, 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 the original language. Jude takes this root word, pornuo, from which we get our English word pornography. By the way, I just talked to you about a particular sin, but you can tell from the way that we're addressing the term and the way that God addresses it that the term is often broad. It literally is a term that encompasses the many kinds of sexual sin. Always sexual, but many kinds of sexual sins. Jude takes, a, takes this root word, pornuo, and he attaches to it a prefix, which in reality is a preposition. You're very familiar with it because we see it on our signs, like right there above that little door. It's the Greek preposition, ak, which we say as ax as an exit, it means out. Some of you might want to go out as God touches on some of these things, so to me. Jude says that the sin that the angels sinned that Peter references in 2 Peter chapter 2 and we believe is unfolding in Genesis chapter 6 that the sin that they sinned was fornication. It was pornuo, but it was ek pornuo. So it wasn't just gross immorality, but was, and we run out of superlatives. That's the point. Jude, writing under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, attaches ek to pornuo, which means gross immorality. And now all of a sudden we got to talk about or try to envision a sexual sin that is a sin all the way out. It's a sexual sin to the max. It, 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 it is um, uh, extreme, gross, sexual immorality. That's the term that Jude uses here in his epistle. And then Jude says something, and wow, this is interesting. Sure, I'm glad I'm not Jude. Jude goes on to say something that would get him in a peck of trouble today. He likens the gross sexual immorality of the angels where they co-mingled and cohabitated with human females to the gross sexual immorality of Sodom and Gomorrah, which was the sin of what class? Homosexuality. We love the homosexual. We hate the gross, immoral, abominable sin of homosexuality. And Jude is here, again, speaking against this grave sin. Let me put it together for you. Jude says both the angels and the sodomites went after strange flesh. For Sodom and Gomorrah, the strange flesh was the grave sin of homosexuality. Man on man, woman on woman. For the angels, the strange flesh was human, female, flesh. I leave you with a reminder from last week. You can stay with me in regard to this. I'm restating how much God loves you. I'm reproclaiming that he is not just the creating God, but he is the seeking and saving God. 
And we know, we've touched on it time and time again already this morning, that God has done everything that he needs to do in order for you and I to be rescued from our sin, from the penalty and even the power of our sin. I also remind you that in contrast to how much God loves you, Satan hates you that much. I remind you that Satan hates you enough in order to want to destroy you. I remind you that that's actually his name. I remind you that the Apostle John, as he's writing the revelation that he states in Revelation 9 and verse 11, and we've rehearsed it many times, two of Satan's many names, in the Hebrew, Abaddon, and in the Greek, Apollyon, meaning of both destroyer. I remind you again of 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 that Satan is like a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may destroy. Satan did all that he could to stop the Redeemer from coming. Listen, this has personal in, impact on your life. Satan did all that he possibly could to stop the Redeemer from coming. We that have been here and studying through Genesis are especially um, sensitive to and appreciate that Satan's uh, seeking to stop and interfere with God's plan right from the get-go so that God created man and woman and then it wasn't probably a very long time before Eve, Satan had Eve's ear and he paved the way for her to be deceived and Adam followed subsequently. Then God gave them the promise of the Redeemer in Genesis 3.15 because Adam and Eve had sinned and that meant their death, instantaneously spiritual death, now separated from God. By the way, that's what our sin does. It very effectively separates us from God. Spiritual death instantaneously, Adam and Eve instantaneously separated from God. The communion and fellowship that they so very much enjoyed and made life all that it ought to be was severed. But they also would physically die. And the process of death, even physically, took its turn. But God continued to seek and to save. And he really, with the promise of the Redeemer, would overcome that sin if man would embrace God's solution. And he promises the Redeemer, as I've already stated in Genesis 3.15, the blessed protevangelium, the first mention of the good news of Jesus Christ, the coming of the Redeemer. And then we watch through the narrative as Satan at every turn tries to prevent that. And so, and it's not our opinion, it's the biblical narrative that we watch as Satan literally fills Cain. And Cain kills godly Abel. Satan says, I think we've stopped the coming of the Redeemer. And God says, wait just a minute. And God gives to Adam and Eve in his grace and mercy a substitute in the form of Seth. But then we watch as Satan again begins to maneuver. And regardless of your interpretation of what actually takes place in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, this we know, that Satan once again is seeking to sabotage the plan of God. Seeking to stop the coming of the one who, for most of us, has absolutely transformed our lives. Satan, here, if you take this view that we have been discussing, you would recognize that Satan here is going so far as to seeking to sabotage the, ent the entire human race. Of course, he has and will continue to do all that he can. He'll do everything he possibly can to keep you from being saved. That's why we continue to plead with you to trust Christ. 
And then upon your salvation, he'll do absolutely everything he possibly can to keep you stalled. Keep us carnal and casual. Certainly not passionate about the things of God. Certainly not obedient to the calls and commissions of Christ. Certainly not sensitive to the fact that we are living in a world that is spiritually lost and dying. And certainly not conscious of the fact that Satan isn't only bad, he's absolutely evil and will do all that he can to take you down with him. I plead with you again today, be saved. Say, Pastor Tom, what do you mean by that? I, I mean, take a look again at your sin and realize that it very effectively separates you from God and then take a look again at the one and only Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. There was only one who came. There was only one who hung on Calvary's cross. There was only one who bore the penalty of your and my sins, yea, the sins of the whole wide world. There was only one who was buried. There's only one who rose from the grave. There's only one who stands spiritually even this morning and offers to every man, woman, and child the forgiveness of sin, the gift of eternal life, and heaven as their eternal home. All of that and more ours for the receiving, the taking, for it is a gift too precious to be earned. Be saved today. Pray to receive Christ as your own personal Savior. And by the way, if you need help with that, or if you have any questions about that at all, I would be absolutely thrilled to field those questions for you. You can come now. You can catch me in just a few moments in the back. Be saved today. And then, child of God, having put your faith and trust in the one and only Savior, live for Jesus. Let's thwart Satan's plan. Knowing that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Knowing that we know who wins in the end. We have every reason to be living practically victorious Christian lives now. Heavenly Father, impress these things upon our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Greater is he than is in us. We have a great, great God. And that great God in the times past dealt with the sin of the angels. And that great God dealt with the sin of mankind. Great in his holiness. Great in his love. Great in his mercy. Let's stand singing verse 3 of hymn number 2. How great thou art. And when I think of God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I can, scarce can take it in. Verse, two, uh, verse 3 of hymn number 2. <clears throat> and when I think of God, his son not sparing, Sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Brother Reed Abram is going to close us in a word of prayer. Brother Reed. Father, we thank you for this 
opportunity we've had to look into your word this morning, and we just pray that your Holy Spirit would apply it to our lives, that we would know and not forget that Satan walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he, whom he may devour. But we also know that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, and help us to realize that, that we can overcome his daily assaults against us by being close to our Lord and Savior. For Jesus said he'll never leave us, he'll never forsake us. And we just uh, pray that you'd apply that to our lives. Help us as we go on our way to think about the things that he is trying to trip us up in our lives and turn them over to Jesus as we go to prayer each day. Guide us now, we pray, and help us to return in Jesus' name. Amen.